Yes. So first of all, I will start with some disclosure. My research in laboratory at the court supported by various grants from national and international organizations. We do also collaborate with industry. This you can see Allergan is one of the agencies that supported one of the research projects, which I will talk today. We also have grants from Pfizer, Purdue. I also on advisory board for numerous industry organizations or research organizations that are dealing with spine cord injury. I do not have shares in, a, in Allergan. I do not financially contribute or uh, benefit from talking today about the botulinum toxin. In Botox, I will actually try to address various botulinum toxins, even though I truly appreciate support from Allergan for this lecture. What I will talk today. First of all, I will introduce you what is this bug which actually is responsible for production of toxins. We will talk a little bit about botulinum clostridia, one of the bug which hugely important for these topics. I will talk with you about variety of toxins and what are the present clinical application of these toxin, toxins, and specifically I will talk what are the benefits or possible complications that we see when we treat individuals with spine cord injury with various botulinum toxins. So, so first of all, one slide or two slides about microbiology. We surrounded by trillions, trillions of bugs, which are sometimes, most of the time, benign. They covered our skin, our gut, our oral cavity, they are in the dust, and they're divided by their structure. We will talk predominantly today about the bacillus, bugs which are elongated and looks like this shape. And if we talk a little bit more about microbiology of Clostridium family, this is, you see, long, long, long list of various bugs which belong to the same family, Clostridium, but still in this family there are a few bugs that some of you are very familiar. One of them, C. difficile, Clostridia difficile, which is the most horrific bug at any hospital environment when our patients get this bug and develop severe difficile, difficile diarrhea. There is a bug, Clostridium tetany, which is responsible for one of the horrific diseases, tetanus. And most of us hopefully got already immunization against tetanus. But we today talk about Clostridium botulinum. This bug actually responsible for secretion or production of these very interesting toxins, which we discuss in the next few moments. So first of all, I will ask you a few questions and I will try to answer them. What are the botulinum toxins? How these toxins are produced? How do they affect the human body? So, so this is a phase of Clostridium botulinum. This is how this bacteria growing in petri dish. And the origin of this word, Clostridium botulinum, coming actually from a combination of German and Latin, which is, means botulus or sausage. And why this name came about, it came because botulinum was initially associated with poisoning from the eating sausages. And in Germany, there are numerous cases, serious cases, were described in the beginning of the 18th century when numerous and numerous patients at the one of the feast were developing these bizarre symptoms after eating not well prepared sausage. And that's where there is a name coming from long, long time ago. We have to do remember that this bug has, as I mentioned, present everywhere, on our food, on our hands, on soil, and only at certain points when we digest this bug and digest as a sausage. There are numerous cases when non-well cooked food, which is canned food, will develop toxins, bugs will grow and develop toxins inside of the canned food. But even honey, which most of the time is not either pasteurized or cooked for a long time, can contain uh, botulinum toxins because of botulinum clostridia will excrete these symptoms and uh, CSC toxins. And that's why this is the most common food sources that result in botulinum infection and toxins. Let's talk a little bit about 
what are the positive aspects of botulinum toxin. And this is a long, long, long release that at the present time we do know where use of variety of botulinum toxins could be helpful with variety of disorder from musculoskeletal disorder to ophthalmological disorder to endocrinological disorder, skin issues, pain, and so on and so on. We will focus slightly on more. So there is a lot of goods about use at the present time of botulinum toxins. Slowly back to the history, this is one of the first person, the German doctor, Dr. Kerner, who <coughs> described one of the series of cases and published these publications about um, toxins that was probably resulted in this poisoning from the sausages. Then later he did more work on these issues, and then Dr. Muller in 1970, and then in 1985, finally Clostridium botulinum bacteria was isolated, and eventually neurotoxin by Dr. Edward Schwartz was prepared. That's what we're talking about, 18th century, beginning of 18th century, a long time ago, when we already know about something bad and possibly good about the toxins. But obviously we came also in the use of botulinum toxin long, long way. As the majority know that first, one of the first indications that botulinum toxin came to medicine was cosmetic use. And right now we have a variety of toxins produced by a variety of companies. This is the one of the list from Botox produced by Allergan, Disport produced by Ipsen, Myoblock produced by Solid and Neuroscience, and Xiamin by Med Pharmaceuticals in Germany. That's why choices such as variety of toxin actually, which are inside of these bottles, there are a variety of indications for each of these toxins, and that's why when physicians try to think about this and discuss with patients, we actually have to be clear aware which toxin we're planning to use for which indications presently approved. And that's why what mostly I will talk about Botox and Xiaomin, that's why at least two of the toxins most commonly presently approved in Canada for treatment of people with spinal cord injury. There is recently also approved uh, Disport for the cosmetic use. Let's talk a little bit how botulinum toxins actually working at the level of muscles, either striatal muscles or smooth muscles. That's the striat muscles, muscles which we can move. Smooth muscles, muscles which we cannot move with, with our emotions, such as, for example, bloody muscles or gastrointestinal muscles or vocal cords sometimes, and some smooth muscles in other areas. This is a junction between nerve fiber and muscle, and we call it neuromuscular junction. Between the two ends, between the axon of the neuron and muscle fiber, there is tiny small area which we call synapse or synaptic cleft. And what is important to know is that axon of neuron, motor neuron from the spinal cord, bringing to the muscle acetylcholine, and acetylcholine typically is compound into the specific, what we call, synaptic vesicles. The synaptic vesicles, when excitation comes, excitement of neurons will come to the synaptic membrane, they fuse together, and acetylcholine will be released, and then reach the muscle, and muscle will contract. This is a normal physiological response on activation of the motor fiber. Botulinum toxin will come and destroy a tiny small protein, which is called anchor protein or SNAP protein. And this SNAP25 protein actually responsible for bringing vesicles with acetylcholine to the membrane and fuse them. And then synaptic vesicle will be allowed to open and it still will go out. When botulinum toxin came, synaptic vesicles cannot anchor, they cannot fuse with membrane, and it's still colleen stay inside of the terminals, and therefore there is no muscle contraction occurring after botulinum toxin injections. So, so this is what we know right now in some kind of simplified way how injection of botulinum toxin affect interaction between neurons 
and muscles. Next time, you can ask me a question about what is the units which we're using with dosing of botulinum toxins. And units actually define their called biological units, which actually titration, what is the highest dose of the specific drug, specifically talking in the portraits, could result in death of the mice. And then this considered of the little dose to 50%, and then we consider considering that this is a biologically active unit. We have to remember that each botulinum toxin has different strengths, different toxicity. And therefore, for example, one unit of botulinum toxin or botox versus one unit of the disport are not correspond. Disport, for example, much weaker in comparison with botulinum toxin from other gun. And that's why physicians who do injections have to keep in mind how we're calculating doses which we can inject a variety of toxins. That's why sometimes when you hear from physicians, you will need 200 units. Most commonly in the GF strong, our patients will receive either Allergan, Botox, or Zyman from Merck. And their units are actually very, very close. And this is what I just described. For example, on my blog is 50% by 50 times less potent than Allergan units. And therefore, for example, 100 units of Botox, approximately equivalent of 5,000 of the myoblock units. And then you can see there are different, actually, toxins in these drugs in the botulinum toxin produced by the Allergan and Botox. There is a botulinum toxin type A. It's one of the type of protein. And another toxin, sometimes it's type A as well, or type B. Again, it's not important, most important to know what they do with our human body. And then as physicians have to know all these issues and how they affect. At the present time, with respect of dosing, most recommended dose with respect of spinal cord injury, if we're doing, for example, injection for the bladder management, it's 200 units approved by protocol and up to 400 units if we're treating focal spasticity, what is recommended by brochure. But again, it is depending on the severity of one or another condition. Spasticity could be treated with a less amount of botulinum toxin, or sometimes physicians make choice of, I know some cases, up to 600 units of botox can be injected. This, at the present time, a major approved condition for the botulinum toxin, Botox, toxin A, and Zyman, botulinum toxin also A, from two different companies. As you can see, list for the injections for the Botox coming from blepharospasm related to eyes, cervical dystonia related to muscle disbalance in the neck, chronic migraine, severe headaches, and then few issues related specifically to spinal cord injury. Oh, where is my box and other box? Yes. Focal spasticity, overactive bladder, and then we also have issues with severe sweating, hyperhidrosis, when some areas of the body produce severe sweat, and then we can actually also utilize botulinum toxin even in individuals with spinal cord injury. The another condition approved by Botox for strabismus. It is a when disbalance of the muscles within the eye and person has double vision, we can use it also. And obviously cosmetic use. With respect to spinal cord injury for Zyman, Zyman is also approved, but also approved for the treatment of upper limb spasticity. And that's why some of the patients actually in Vancouver, depending on the preference and coverage for using one or another. That's a majority right now, significant at least spectrum of possible effects of Botox is much larger than other known and approved toxins around the world. That's a first of all, uh, hyperhidrosis, <laughs> horrible condition. Of course, it's uncomfortable socially. 
and some people who have severe sweating in the axilla, in the palms, in the perineal areas. This is particularly important for people with spinal cord injury, but unfortunately, at the present time, approved indication is only in axillary area. And that's, a, for example, when we find a person with spinal cord injury who has profuse sweating in some specific area, we sometimes can try it, but it could be not approved indication, and then we, it's either will be covered or not covered. In the hospital, it will be covered most of the time. But it's a possibility. The next important indication is obviously spasticity. And majority of patients with spinal cord injury do develop severe spasticity, and then decision about management could be made in combination either with the oral medications and additional botulinum toxin when oral medications are not sufficient enough. And one of the obvious advantages of the botulinum toxin is that every single known antispastic medication will result in some effect of the central nervous system, including cognitive dysfunctions, fatigue, and this is what people don't like about big doses of baclofen or big doses of tizanidine or benzodiazepines, which we commonly use for management of spasticity. Botox is helpful with this respect because it's injected only locally and does not affect cognitive functions and central nervous system. And that's why this is one of the advantages. How are we doing it? I brought also with me my big helper or a little helper. Typically, we're using EMG guidance for injection of botulinum toxin in specific muscles, or we're also using ultrasound guided injections. And why we're using this? Because one of the aspects, yes, physician should know very well anatomy. But when you're trying to inject in a tiny small muscle, sometimes it's only two figures are bothersome for a person with upper extremity spasticity. You have to find use fine needle and localize this specific group of muscles in order to do very clear, fine, precise injections. And EMG guidance allowed us either electrically stimulate this tiny small muscle and inject necessary amount of botulinum toxin botox into this area and then see effects within a nine to 10 days. The same effects could be achieved with uh, ultrasound guided. And it's right now preference of physician who do these injections, one, which one technique to use in order to help to do these focal injections. And obviously it is good. That I'm trying to always to show what is good or what is bad or what is ugly about this knowledge. And finally, very important approved indication for Botox is management of neurogenic bladder following spinal cord injury. We do know that bladder has a very strong control from our brain, from our spinal cord, and it's a very social organ. We have to have a specific environment in order to go and empty bladder. We have to have a very good strong connections from the bladder signals to our brain to know when bladder is full and everything is fine when all these connections are present. Unfortunately, after spinal cord injury, there is a severe disruption of connections between the brain and bladder muscle, and there are four persons with spinal cord injury, what we call developed neurogenic bladder, where is the bladder wall walking separately, where is the sphincter, which is responsible for continence, walking separately, and they're not coordinated. And in order to improve function of the bladder, what is known neurogenic detrusal bladder, we try to reach, we try to inject the Botox into the bladder wall, which relax the bladder, increase capacity of the bladder, and therefore prevent leakage frequencies when bladder uncontrollably uh, contracting. But most important, this is a, what is a, one of the interesting studies that we recently, not recently, <laughs> doing for the last two years. I asked question, 
Oh yeah, I have first of all this cut procedure. That's why right now is approved injection to the blood at 200 units. And there are a few studies which were conducted with injection of up to 300 units to the bladder. Blood, the different parts of bladder has to be injected within the 20 sites approximately. And then, as I mentioned to you, increase bladder volume and capacity, and obviously decrease the presence of incontinence is a major outcome. But again, it's important to know that person have to start if he did not or she did not catheterize, but do frequent or regular catheterization in order to empty this relaxed and quiet blood. That's why a few years ago, when I obviously as a physiatrist knew about already benefits of blood injection for the botox for neurogenic issues, I asked question, can this injection also help to other conditions such as autonomic dysreflexia because we do know that abnormal blood pressure control and these episodes of high blood pressure frequently occurring when blood start to contract. And that's why this question I ask to Allergan, I start to talk with the company, I start to spoke, speak with different agencies and Right now, we already published our preliminary data on 14 individuals with spinal injury that we conducted here in I court. We received support. Where it is? Good job. Yes, we received support from Recancin Institute, and we received drugs provided by Allergan. And the main goal of the study was if already established blood injection protocol for detrusor dyssynergia for neurogenic bladder, not only could increase, improve blood function, but also diminish or improve this blood pressure dysregulations that we see in people with spinal injury. Why we did it? As you know, five minutes here, but I'm at the end. <laughs> That's why we did it. As you know, majority of you are very passionate about possible negative effect of autonomic dysreflexia, and this is a one of them when person with spinal injury develops stroke because of blood dysfunctions. And in addition to his spinal injury, disability was complicated with uh, stroke consequences because of high, high elevated blood pressure. That's what we did, we recruited 14 subjects, we're still doing this study, we're almost at the end, and a few people in my laboratory who are doing this study right now in the room. We did urodynamics in people with spinal injury before Botox and measure blood pressure continuously. And after Botox within one month, and some of the, my patients are, who successfully completed this study are here. I will not go through the urodynamics, but what most important I would like to show that there are different parameters that we have to record, including intravesical pressure, abdominal pressure, EMG, but this is what is important. At the moment when blood start to contract, there is a simultaneously occurring blood pressure increases. Body of person with spinal injury immediately responds violently with this sudden increases of blood pressure, which occurring during the first sensation, first desire to avoid and then during the urge to urinate. And this is what we don't want to see because there is a traumatic increase of arterial blood pressure increase. So, so when we did this study, what we demonstrated, blood pressure before the injection of Botox and after injection of Botox. You see, in majority of people, we were able to decrease dramatically this increase in blood pressure. Furthermore, this change in blood pressure also decreased, and what we demonstrated that more than 50% people who were injected with Botox totally did not show any episodes of autonomic dysreflexia during urodynamics. And in the 40%, urodynamics increased only slight increased blood pressure. Another very interesting outcome of this study was we looked through the whole day of 24 hours of blood pressure monitoring the person with spinal injury before the Botox. And this is a typical was highest blood pressure up to 170, 180 millimeters during the day before Botox. Up to 14 episodes a day person with spinal injury experience because of blood related issues. 
After the botox, the same test and the same person, we were able to decrease blood pressure to about 150. With this, typically, we don't need pharmacological management, and frequency of episode decreased to only seven. That's why Botox is a drug. I talk to you about the good aspects. Three slides with the bad things about the Botox and what we have to seek when we inject Botox or recommending Botox. First of all, there are numerous uh, conditions where we recommend not to do Botox. Any condition associated with abnormalities of muscular junctions, such as myasthenia gravis, which already predisposed person to have a possible negative effect. Active blood infections, pregnancy without no long-term effect on the infant, and then known allergy to Botox, but these issues become lately very, very minimal. <coughs> Next, we definitely know that in some cases, particularly in pediatric cases, injection of Botox could result in a spread outside of the injected area. And then person present with some weaknesses and difficulties outside of the injected area. There are numerous cases were described, typically associated with a large doses and in pediatric population, but this has to be known and we always talk about this with patients. Finally, this is a, what are possible complications listed on the brochures for botulinum toxin by, published by FDA. They are divided on typical complications related to any injections, bleeding, bruising, or infections at the site. It's not related to Botox, but also some specific complications related to Botox, which are, have to be discussed with patients, but they are very, very typically minimal. And finally, one of the aspects which I'm always talking with my patients when I'm injecting small muscles of the spastic arm is that sometimes we don't have a clear crystal ball to say you need five units and you need 6.5 units for in order to decrease spasticity in the small hand muscles. And sometimes injection of a small dose of Botox could slightly higher level of weaknesses which we needed. But typically, thanks God to Botox, how it's working, within the three, four months, effects of Botox disappear and function return to normal. But again, this has to be abnormal. That's a take home message. We talk about sausage, we talk about Botox, we talk about possible interesting applications. But I would like to finish and give a chance to talk to my former patients. So my present patients, this lovely lady, who did underwent through the trial, she allowed me to use this statement. And as I understood, it was definitely a big change in her life with respect to blood management. And, now, and I know that John also will talk to us about his feeling about the effects with spasticity. But again, I would like to state that each medication has differences with dosing. Each patient will respond differently. Maybe you will hear today a positive beneficial effect that it's helped me. But some patients I do know who are unfortunately still retroactive to effect of Botox, either to very significant spasticity, and in some cases it could be not effective. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will switch to the Terrians, and maybe we'll ask questions at the end. Okay. I am not getting paid by Botox either. <laughs> Um, I actually was, uh, can say I was one of those research uh, studies. I, I, I should say I've been hurt for 20 years. I'm C6, complete, Asia A, um, due to a motor vehicle accident. So 20 years ago, and they Im immediately started, I have a spastic bladder. Um, I was doing intermittent ca uh, catheters, still am. And I had a lot of incontinence uh, at first, when I was uh, first injured. I was on Ditropan for, I don't know, even know, 10 years, probably more. Uh, then I switched to Detrol, um, just based on some peer information I got that it was supposed to be better for me, it made me feel better. So I did that for a few years. And then I decided that I wanted to get pregnant, so I didn't want to be on any medication. Um, God, so I went off everything uh, and just dealt with all the issues that uh, the bladder gave me at that time. 
And if I think about how many times I get that a day, you know, at, at least going to the bathroom every time I have a sensation of having to urinate, I get AD. So that could be six times a day on average, right? And then on top of that, you know, you're doing your bowel routine, you're, you know, have other things going on. So, um, and when I heard that that was kind of, you know, dangerous to myself, for my heart, and for my well-being, um, life expectancy. I thought, okay, well, and I heard this study came out. I thought I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it. And uh, one thing you should know about me is I am totally against taking any drug there is. I was after I didn't have to take Ditropan or Detrol anymore. I was on and am on no medications whatsoever. So um, I was really against. My urologist had recommended Botox to me before, but I'm like, oh no, I don't want to put any chemicals. But I did it for the study um, for the AD study. And it uh, completely took away the AD pretty much altogether. I, I was really worried that I wouldn't have a signal because I use AD to, um, for those of you that, sorry, don't know what AD is, autonomic dysreflexia, um, for the, I, I use that to know when I have to go to the bathroom. So uh, that was my sign, and I was really worried that I wouldn't have that anymore, um, and how would I know, and I would have to always be on a schedule, and I hate being on a schedule. Uh, but I still got a bit of a sensation. Uh, it definitely wasn't as strong. My blood pressure didn't go up as high. I didn't have the sweats. Um, you know, could the volume definitely increased a considerable amount. Uh, and I wasn't, you know, one thing I noticed before was that I never really transferred very much. So um, just because I was always worried, and especially when I transferred, that would put pressure on my bladder, and then leakage could happen at that point. Um, so if I'm stationary, I am usually am okay and can kind of hold it a little bit and get to the bathroom one time. But as soon as I have to transfer anywhere, that pressure on my stomach then just uh, then, you know, problems will occur. So I never transferred. So I never transferred to like a booth or to another chair or to the couch or anything like that. And uh, so my confidence grew so much more because I didn't have that those issues anymore. Um, I've done Botox now uh, again another time. So I, I just had it done about six months ago, I guess. And I still don't have any problems with my bladder. I don't know if it lasts as long. The AD for me um, is usually, I can tell it start coming back around three months. Uh, and then, but with the incontinence, and now when I get incontinent, it's really around menstruation time is the only time that I'll have it or if I have a symptom of a UTI. And nothing like that happens for me anymore, having taken it. So. I, um, it, it really works for me. I, um, I know that some people it doesn't work as well for, but uh, I have great things to say about it. John? Um, hi, everybody. I'm John, uh, 23 years post-injury. Um, I guess, uh, disclosure, I work for the Rick Hansen Institute, um, which has funded some laundry study. I am not paid by allergen or Botox either. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. So for me, my issues are on muscle spasticity. Um, I have very high muscle spasticity, constant tone, and flexor, extensor spasms, and clona. So you know, the gap, anyone you could get. Um, and primarily, it was initiating my legs, uh, but the spasticity would sort of become all encompassing. I get my abdominal muscles, and my back, and my neck, and my hands, and my feet, and everywhere. Um, and so from the point of my injury in '93. I was taking oral medications, I was taking back with them. I did that for about five years until one day I realized I didn't really remember the last five years because of all the cognitive decline that Botox was causing me, so I basically cut cold turkey on that. Sorry, uh, back, did I say Botox? Baclofen. Baclofen, sorry. Um, yeah, and then, uh, you know, I, I sort of cut cold turkey and the spasticity got tighter, stronger and stronger. The tissue got tighter and tighter, so then I looked at other things and I started going to, um, sorry, the uh, clonazepam, which is a benzodiazepine. Is it benzo? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which there's a whole variety of them that you can take. And I took that very sporadically, uh, as rarely as I possibly could, until the spasticity started getting worse and I started taking it more and more. And then 
again, I started having cognitive issues where I couldn't, um, I couldn't, my, my vocabulary started to shrink. I couldn't find the words, and uh, sort of cognitive declines that I find come along with some of these medications. And then I switched over to Pyzanidine, and that worked quite well, except pyzanidine has got a very short life cycle, and when you take it, it hits you like a ton of bricks, and then it starts to wear off, and so you get this blood pressure with plummet, and you get fatigue, and they're just, you know, all these medications that I've taken over the years always had something that came along with them that I really didn't like. Um, and so I heard about Botox a few years before, and I thought, oh, I don't want to be sticking a toxin in my body, blah, blah, blah. And then one day I went and saw Andre, and he said, well, you know, if you're worried about what it's going to be like, I have an incomplete injury, I can stand up and, and do standing transfers and take a couple of steps with some balance aids. Um, and he said, well, if you're you know, concerned about what it's going to be like, we can give you an a injection in your muscles of uh, lidocaine, which is sort of like a, the same freezing that a dentist would use to, to freeze your mouth when you're in dental surgery. And that will give you a small little two to three hour window of what the effect of Botox would be sort of like. And uh, yeah, he gave me the injections and instantly I had this relief throughout my entire body and the spasticity dissipated and I was able to stand up and move my legs in ways that I wasn't able to due to the contractions and spasticity. And so, uh, yeah, I so said, Andre, sign me up, let's give this a try. Um, so it does work very, very well for me. I've been using it for about four years now. Um, there are some drawbacks. Of course, it is exceptionally expensive, particularly for, you know, for me getting it in leg muscles. Um, they're very large muscles, you need very high dosages. Um, I think probably the highest I've had is 600 units, um, which if you're paying out of your own pocket, that's close to $2,000 right there. Um, thankfully, you know, for focal spasticity, Pharmacare will cover it. Um, I've also got coverage through work, so you know, it reduces the expense to me. But um, the benefit I find over some of the oral medications is, is, is a way by, by the cost. Um, for me, I find Botox only lasts about three months in the larger muscles of the legs. Um, usually, like Andre was saying, this is something that I think if anybody's contemplating it, um, it doesn't work right away. When you get the injection, it takes 10 days to two weeks before you actually start to see any effect whatsoever, if you're going to see an effect. So I believe, Andre, some people don't get the effect whatsoever, do they? Uh, and so, you know, it takes a little while for it to kick in, and then it gradually increases in effect for about six weeks, and then for me, and then it starts to gradually decrease down to about 12 weeks. So you got about a three-month window, uh, three to four-month window. Um, and I think with the smaller, smooth muscles in the bladder, it tends to last a little longer. Andre, you can correct up me. To nine, up to nine months. Up to nine months. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not just a one-shot deal where you can just walk away and, and never have to worry about it again. It is something you need to maintain. Um, I have um, you know, quite a large social network and I talk to people from all around the world. I know of uh, more than a few people in different parts of the world who have gotten Botox injections done by their GP or by somebody who isn't a, an expert in the application of it and they did not have very good effect from it. Um, they didn't have any negative effects, they just didn't find that it did, did affect them. So I do recommend that, you know, to anybody who's planning to get it done, go to a specialist who really knows what they're doing. Somebody like Andre, somebody who works in this fast city clinic, somebody who is, is properly trained in injecting Botox because it's it's not the same as getting a flu shot. You know, it needs to be applied in the absolute right places. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, I think it's been a, a pretty positive experience from I would uh, I, I would say um, so when we were talking about side effects so for me the ditropan and the detrol I didn't realize what side effects it had on me until I went off them and uh, then I was really clear headed and you know wasn't tired all the time and that's what made me never want yeah the dry mouth never want to go back to that again. So you have to kind of weigh out your side effects and what you're willing to do. It's actually, I don't have pain in the sense of I am cl complete, but I do uh, feel every tw of those 20 shots that go into my bladder and it is not comfortable. Um, and afterwards I am not, I'm sort of a little bit out of it, but it does work pretty much right away for me actually. So yeah. Question, comments? Chuck, you ask the people who Anyone have... Anyone in the room who has a question? Do you, are you aware of any of the long-term effects of the Botox? Like over years, having to have it done regularly? 
No, this is a very good question. This is was one of the major concern of the long-term effect on the either smooth muscles in the bladder or uh, muscles uh, in the skeletal muscles. So far, as you heard, patients receiving the Botox for many, many years, and there are some suggestions that eventually some people will use to it. There is no yet confirmed studies. Gistologically, there are a few studies we're looking into the skeletal muscles and bladder. Actually, we have urologists here with us from Switzerland. What is the so, histology? So in Switzerland, is one of the first things that ever happened. The important thing is that the first thing is to do that. And just come to this uh, study about 15 years of use of products in patients. And we have patients that come in for 15 years, getting their regular product shot, go out and come back. Sometimes it works a little bit better, sometimes a little bit not so good. Six months, maybe nine months, maybe seven months, depending on the condition. But they are so satisfied that they will not trade for any patients. Yeah, I do. But there are some, um, also some patients that do not respond after the first one, after the second one. The majority of response after the third try of COVID. So we don't give up if the first try didn't work, the second try was not so good. Yet there's no reason exactly to can tell why is it happening after the three. It's better. You have to be aware that you must. That there's no urinary tract infection, but this can come with the stabilization of the Thank you, Dr. Walter. Um, and I was going to say just a, a little add on to my previous uh, little statements there um, that it, it's not a cure all, it's not going to stop your spasms. Um, like Terry said, it's not going to stop your dysreflexia or, or completely you know, make your bladder expand exponentially. Um, there are limitations to it. You know, for me, I get it in certain areas that trigger most of the spasticity in my body and it allows me to function day to day without having that massive amount of spasticity in my body. But I still have spasms, you know, like right now I my legs dance for you real quick, um, you know, and I've just had Botox uh, about two weeks ago, I guess, so it's, it's starting to take effect. So it's not going to eliminate it altogether, but it certainly re reduces that spasticity and, and makes you know, your day-to-day -day life a lot easier. The other thing, too, Dr. K, is maybe, um, I, th I think my re urologist said this, when people have uh, side effects, or so to speak, um, he was saying that it could be that you're using those muscles and you don't actually realize it. So, it, it, you know, if you're transferring and you don't realize, you know, that you're using certain muscles of your body and then all of a sudden you have Botox in them, you could fall, right? I mean, and you don't even know, right? But that's what I mentioned about mm -hmm. excessive weakness. The main idea of inject Botox into the skeletal muscles to make them weaker. But to make them weaker in order to make person who is have spasticity to better comfort, to less jerks, to prevent sheer stress on the skin when your muscle constantly contracting and you can damage the skin. But exactly what Terry mentioned, the same muscles with the spasticity, many of my patients using to make this jump from chair to the bed, from bed to the chair, because then spasm actually helping to do this move. And that's why if we make this muscle weaker, then transfers sometimes become different. Then you have to either relearn and adjust, and it's reality. I know an individual who um, his bladder was in constant contraction, um, and so he used a, an indwelling indwelling catheter because his bladder could only hold very small amounts. Um, and he had the Botox there, thinking that, okay, now I can, can do intermittent catheters. But what he didn't realize was that constant contraction on his bladder was creating core stability for him. So it allowed him to stand, sit up independently. It allowed him to, to do you know, some pretty nice transfers. And once those muscles were relaxed, he lost a lot of that core stability and had a lot more difficulty with his transfers. So for him, he decided to, to not do the Botox again. But again, it wears off, so it's not like it's a permanent problem. You had a question? Oh, I was just going to ask you about, um, uh, because you're incomplete, um, that you find that um, psychological events um, 
your surroundings and things like that, will that um, encourage your spasms? Like if there's um, a different event, like stressors or non-stressors, perhaps it's um, uh, whatever it is, it, it, it might set your spasms off more likely than not. Absolutely, yeah. You know, there's uh, no doubt about it in my mind. I've actually been speaking with one of Andre's uh, former students about maybe doing a, a research study into some of the environmental factors that can increase muscle spasticity. Um, for me, stress, um, adrenaline, diet, like eating a sh sweet um, donut that's full of sugar, boosts up my sugar levels, boosts up my insulin levels, and so my spasticity levels. <laughs> <laughs> he had Botox, well, it's I'm all good. I'm just wondering, do you practice any um, uh, different ways of covering yourself? Very much so. Um, I definitely have learned sort of self meditation, breathing techniques, trying to calm myself, calm my my body. Um, you know, try to eat well, keep well hydrated. Um, I don't have the answer or the, the perfect recipe, but uh, definitely, you know, if you get excessively agitated um, or various other stimulants that you can take, too much caffeine, too much cola. Things like that, all these things can, can have a huge effect on your toxicity. Um, I have questions from afar, so I just want to make sure we get them in on the video. Um, so, one person asks um, Dr. K, um, will Botox work in a male that has had a previous sphincterotomy, and would there be an issue with leaking in between catheterization? Um, I will give it question to urologist who is present in the so, audience. So, the sphincter, so we have to be careful with sphincter. The sphincter is a, a striped muscle which we can always access compared to the chosen muscle that allows us not to leak. So, if you have a sphincterotomy, that means this muscle is not working. And now it depends on when the sphincterotomy was performed. Because over time, it will scare and create a the scar narrowing of the, of the outlet of the nerve. So depending on, on the sphincter situation, <coughs> the, the condition of leaking is not changing by a photo because it just allows the blood to um, have more volume over a certain time until either sensation or on an anticipated case. But it does not change the, um, the work of the sphincter. There were other patients that you can also, if it's too spastic, you can inject water into the sphincter to uh, reduce the spasticity of the sphincter. But depending on the situation um, of the sphincter, if it's narrow or if it's not working at all, it's a different perspective, but it doesn't change the value. My recommendation would be also, I totally agree with Dr. Walter's uh, response, will be review his blood, the present situation, and speak the capacity with urologist through the urodynamics, and to see at what point leakage is occurring, and this could provide then perspectives what can be useful or how Botox can be useful in his situations. And so a consultation with urologists and urodynamics could be very helpful in this case. Okay. Great. One more. Um, so the other question we have from Afar. Um, one client had Botox in her bladder in January and has had a UTI ever since that she hasn't been able to clear up. Um, and it's left her with spasms that are really troublesome, and as a result, she has blood sweating below the level of her injury. Um, and so it, she has two questions. One, is there anything that can resolve that now that she's had the Botox? And two, um, does a first trial mean that a second trial is not worth doing? We just heard from Dr. Walters that it's not. Mm -hmm. It's probably... If first trial was associated with UTI, yes, unfortunately, any intravesical procedure is associated with possibility of developing UTI. That's UTI has to be treated, investigated. If any other underlying causes for UTI are present, 
And then obviously if she continued to experience symptoms which looks like associated with autonomic dysreflexia, I don't know her level, I don't know her situation, then this can be addressed through a variety of aspects of management of autonomic dysreflexia issues. And then it's again it's a personal choice to make decision, repeat the treatment or not. But one of the aspects we do know is that sometimes first was an unsuccessful attempt, second could be much more successful. Is there any um, difference in success with different types of botulinum toxin? I don't have this experience, particularly with the blood. We have only one in Vancouver site. I do inject occasionally Zyman. I see similar effects, and I believe one of the, my patients who started on Zyman eventually switched to the Botox. We did a few trials, not with you. I have another patient. <laughs> 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 For this woman, this woman, it must be, uh, she must be aware of how she's going to enter the lab. If she's not doing intimate catheterization, which could be the case, um, by tapping or using the greater mm -hmm. maneuver, which you should not recommend, she must, uh, or your just must, uh, Sure that she doesn't have any residual volume because if she cannot empty the bladder completely, there's no way she's going to put up the urinary bed or the urinary tract infection. Right. So this is the this is the most crucial thing. After the bottles, be able to um, empty the bladder completely. Then we should ask you to come sit down. Would you join us? But that's who we have experts. Yeah, the, other, the other thing to just point out that some people may or may not be doing. I know for myself, I take 1500 cc's of vitamin C daily. Some people find cranberry pills useful, and these are techniques and different ways in which some um, spinal cord injury the individual spine help reduce the inner tract infection. General, you know, prevention methods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I know um, one of the things I hear the most is that people are so happy to have Botox for bladder and not have to pee so frequently that they forget to go. Yeah. And they can go all day. And it's a bad they idea. Not realize it. And, <laughs> and I, I know that that would leave you with a huge amount of urine in your bladder that would be an infection risk, okay. um, as well as AD. So. Would that have a negative impact on your kidney? Let's say I fall asleep and I don't wake up for a few hours and I get up and flow into my kidneys, could that potentially damage my kidneys? If you're doing it once, it's okay. But if you're doing it on an everyday basis, we are worried that it could result in what we call hydronephrosis. So what would be the best amount? Of That's a, if you don't remember that you need to catheterize every four hours, put alarm yeah. special applications, wake me up every four hours. The typical recommended volume is about 400 cc's. Some females have a smaller volumes, but above 400, 500 cc's, we have high possibility to increase intravesical pressure and develop what we call a reflux, flux of the urine into the ureters and then to the kidneys. And then typically the best indicator how big your blood become is the urodynamics, which then urologist will tell you at this point it is dangerous and so on. And that's what we recommend once a year to see physiatrist, <laughs> once a year to see urologist. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so, would, so then, if you've got the if you've got the Botox and you're catheterizing every four hours. Um, Obviously, it's going to reduce your indication of UTIs, right? Correct. Okay. Does it dissipate completely? Like, what has been your experience prior? I have never really had a huge problem with UTIs, so, but um, I I have always managed my bladder with a whole different things, like with um, so at night I don't drink a lot, right? Uh, because I don't like having to get up in the middle of the night to have to go to the bathroom. So. 
I don't do four hours. I don't set an alarm. So you, so you go <laughs> but the night without I do. To get up and go. Yeah, I mean, I I will wake up if I have to go. So okay. I do get like. But you still didn't get. I still get a bit of AD, and we'll have to wake up. It's usually like a flushing sensation, like a kind of pins and needles type of sensation that I get, and I'll wake up and I'll get really uncomfortable. Um, I may get a little bit of spasm, uh, which is unusual for me too. Feel tight. Um, and so then I'll, I will get up if I have to go to the bathroom, yeah. I will. Sorry. What, Terry, sorry. what Terry mentioned, very important, hydration, proper hydration during the day is absolutely crucial for individual spine cord injury. But timing when you drink and how much you drink has to be very well scheduled. Like Terry mentioned, stop drink excessive amount of fluids after 6 or 7 p.m. That's why you will be able to catheterize at night, whatever, 10, 11, you're going to bed. And then because you don't have excessive volume in your body, you will be able to keep overnight without ex extra catheterization. In the morning, you start again, typical hydration of 2.5 liters a day, which required body to flush and maintain good blood health. I think one of the um, positive side effects of Botox, I see with Terry in her bladder, is that she has better hydration now. She drinks more water. Mm -hmm. uh, I think because the urgency to urinate um, is not as severe as it once was, and the chance of leaks is a lot less, that you know you feel more confident drinking more water throughout the day, which is, is good for you. Um, but like Andre said, every four hours, you cut down at six o'clock. I don't know about you, but every now and then I like to watch a hockey game and drink a few beers. So, you know, if you're going to be drinking a lot of beers in the evening or something, you need to go. Well, I can't wait four hours. You know, just pay attention to how much fluid you're taking in. If you're drinking three pints of beer, that's a lot of fluid. You're going to have to go more frequently. You have to catheterize more frequently. I know I had I had a very, very small bladder volume, like 100 mils, like tiny. I was peeing like every hour. It was really ruling my life. And, um, uh, I resisted trying Botox for a really long time, and I tried it for the first time in January. And um, I drink way more water now, and I've had fewer ATIs. Mm -hmm. And it's only like five months. Yeah, so that's what it's like. You would have less ATIs because yeah. you're drinking more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like, I'm the opposite. I drink at night because I don't want to. I don't want to pee the day. That's the right. Yeah. 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 And I get more sleep and have fewer spasms because. For me, my bladder and bowel really triggers for spasticity, and so I was able to drink more water, which made my bowels work better, and I was able to drink more water, and so I didn't have UTIs, I had a very irritable bladder, and so it really worked for me, but it was quite sore. There is, they do. I didn't have it, and I might ask for it, but yeah, I think I gather it is available. Yeah. It, I don't know. So, <laughs> I do have a question. Am I... Because I don't wake up every four hours to pee. Am I... Is that bad? Because I can go 17 hours. I don't mind this way. It all depends on the volume, oh. as we talk mm -hmm. with you. If your volume after 7 hours is 400 cc or 350, you're safe. But if after seven hours your volume is 1,200 cc's, you're in trouble. Right. I mean, because I know, like, I'll pee before I can sleep. Yeah. yeah. I, I know when I, I do have a sensation. Yeah. I mean, so I know. Yeah. And do you know what sort of volumes you're getting when you go to the bathroom in the morning? Are you getting really high volumes? or In the morning? No. Yeah. You're probably okay. You know, like Andre was saying, if you're waking up in the morning and you're doing like a liter, a liter and a half, that's way too much. But it's if you're very rare that I would wake up in the middle of the night, be like kind of off. Like you mentioned, like I went out for a beer in the night. Well, like for me, I don't need to catheterize it with the nature of my injury is incomplete, and yeah, I go all night quite frequently without having to get up to go pee. Yeah. So. I'm sure we've got a bunch of ABs in the room here that probably do the same thing. And sometimes you have to, sometimes you don't. So, And that's why with every single patient, I have a long conversation about your blood. And your blood, the Terry blood, the John blood, Mr. Smith's blood, 
totally different bladders, totally different patterns, and that's why what we talk with you, what urologists talk with you about how specific your bladder responses to the fluids, what is your injury level and completeness, all this could affect that you will be totally different the story. And each of these first people who are sitting here, totally different story. But it also doesn't necessarily mean you stop taking your medication right away after you have it's it will work. Yeah. yeah. Then you have to make decisions and accordingly recommendation with doctor what to stop, when to stop. That's why, for example, with Botox was successful spasticity, the main idea to decrease antispasmodic medication doses that it will have less effect on the brain function. One thing I don't think I've mentioned is that the needle act for bladder is not covered, mm -hmm. actually. So it's about $150, I think. Or yeah. Three, yeah. Sorry, yeah, the bl the needle for getting blo Botox. Oh, just the needle. Yeah, yeah. Botox. just the needle. Oh, yeah, but the procedure is PBC. Right? Yes, of yeah. course. Yeah. And Botox could be covered by your insurance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and for the, Pharmacare. I think WorkSafe covers the needle, but... The rest of the insurers don't. For bladder, for, for muscle, bladder, you don't yeah, need yeah, a specialized yeah. needle. It's $120, I think, maybe so a little less. less. And they then, consider it an instrument yeah. instead of a yeah. It doesn't make much sense, but that, that is one of the challenges. Um, so we promised we would end it at 730 I'm going to turn off the video, but um, this issue of coverage is a really thorny one. So well, I promise we'll get some of the details on that and post it with the video. And we thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate having Dr. K and Terry and John and everyone who came out and our donuts. Don't forget to